talk about mission critical agility or the importance of having vision and taking risks even when the consequences can be very serious. If you asked your five year old, how, how would we go to the moon? This is what they would say I would build a giant rocket, I would land it on the moon, and then I would fly it back home. So it's not, I suppose, terribly surprising that that was the first design for Apollo, and it stuck around for some time, the direct ascent method. And it was built around the idea that we'll build, first of all, an enormous launch vehicle, even larger than the Saturn V that we ultimately used, which it is a behemoth. I'll mention the Saturn V, the rocket that we eventually used. At the time it was built was the tallest building in the state of Florida. Well, technically, there was only one larger building, and that was the building that held the Saturn V. <laughs> but the Saturn V was driven down a road on wheels and then launched into space. So they launched the largest building in Florida into space. <laughs> the group was led by our next hero, John C. Hubbard. He had a very different idea. So no, instead of launching a giant rocket, we're going to launch a four-part spacecraft that is going to reconfigure many times on its way towards the moon and then reconfigure on its way back to accomplish the mission. And even by today's standards, this sounds like science fiction. Imagine what it sounded like to someone in 1960. But by itself, although it's quite a cool little craft, it's not going to go anywhere. Um, it's missing some kind of important parts, as you can tell. Among them, a engine, which brings the second major component of the Apollo spacecraft into the picture, which is this, the Apollo service module. So there's the engine, finally. Now, this important to note that this whole uh, section here is uh, completely unpressurized. So it has consumables in it, but the astronauts don't get to go in there. They still have to stay in that tiny thing over there. But this part here docks on to the back of the command module, just like that. <laughs> it's gonna be the way that it flies to the moon. So, you know, you can imagine this here part a little bit slowly of separates and spins off to its demise. And just this little thing, from the biggest building in Florida, down to that little thing with three very scared astronauts packed inside, orbits the, the Earth a little bit, and then finally comes in to splash down on the surface, and they climb out very grateful to be alive. Now, let me just bring that whole thing back for you. One of the inventors who got swept up in this excitement and who is the first hero of our stories this morning, is Alexander Graham Bell, whose name I'm sure many of you are familiar with because he is credited with creating at least the first commercially successful telephone, though there were many people. Success working. now has become the difference between alienation from his family, poverty, and loneliness, and everything Alexander dreams of. And so what does he do? All of these people are telling him, focus on anything but the telephone. But overwhelmingly, what Alexander cannot avoid is this draw to create this device. Now, that's vision. That's amazing vision. But in case you happen to think of Alexander suddenly as this superhuman person with incredible vision, I want to point out a very interesting fact, which is that he was laboring, at least on, to some extent, on some false pretense, which he had um, gotten a hold of a book at a younger age written by Holtzman, a German scientist and, and one of the people who did some of the early in, uh, investigations into electricity and audio. And um, he doesn't read German. Alexander Graham Bell didn't read German at the time. I don't either. And so when he tried to read this book, he thought he understood what was going on. He thought he could understand the pictures. And he thought what he was reading was that Hemholtz had successfully sent the sounds of vowels, or parts of speech, through a wire, the electricity, to a distant location. Hemholtz had done nothing of the kind, but Alexander looked at this and said, well, surely if he can do that, then I can figure out how to send all of speech <laughs> via the wire. And so, for many years, Alexander Graham Bell was laboring to reproduce an experiment that had never been accomplished and ultimately did accomplish it, and so much more, which is amazing to me, that 
But it also tells you something, which is that the belief that something is possible is sometimes exactly what is needed to accomplish something great. We all like face this. projects all the time that seem like a dizzying sea of options. So many decisions that have to be met. And everyone around us, our managers, our customers, I think, are quite good at reminding us about all the scary things that could lie behind all of those doors. Oh, if you pick that door and it's wrong, you could bankrupt the company. If you pick that door and you're wrong, well, you could lose your job. And it's interesting that people are very good at reminding us of the risk of change, that the risk of change is something for some reason that everybody gets, everybody can see. It's very palpable, very understandable. You know, you hear, you hear of people punished because they changed something and they were wrong. It's interesting that I think it is more subtle, though every bit as important, to recognize the risk of not changing. But for some reason, people don't seem to be so excited about reminding us about that. So, I want to challenge everyone to use this opportunity, this wonderful gathering of brilliant people to learn and to think about how to dive into the woods, to leave the beaten path, to accomplish something truly great. And I can't wait to see what some of you will bring back from that journey. Thank you.